Hi everybody, welcome to our second lecture where today we're going to talk about mutations or more simply what happens when there's a mistake in our genetic code and the consequences of those mistakes. So then before we get started, I want to do a quick one minute recap of our previous video because a lot of that information is going to tie directly into what we're talking about today. So if you remember, our FH protein, which we can see right here, is going to consist of 510 amino acids. And when we talk about amino acids, these are those chemical building blocks that are put together to form a specific structure that forms our final protein. And so it's going to be the precise order of those amino acids that determine whether or not our protein functions the way it's intended. And so when it comes to protein function, the shape of the protein is going to be integral to whether or not it's able to do its job, which means that if you have a misshapen protein, you're going to have a dysfunctional protein, which is going to lead to a pathological state. And so a mutation then is going to be simply a change to our genetic code. And you can imagine if you change one of these nucleotides, you've changed the codon. If you change the codon, you change the amino acid that's supposed to go in the correct place. If you change the amino acid, you change the structure of the protein. And when you change the structure of the protein, you can cause it to become dysfunctional. And this is what's going to happen in HLRCC. And so there's going to be two broad categories of mutations that we can talk about. The first one being a germline mutation or when you have a change in the genetic material found in either the sperm or the egg cell. And what's important about these mutations in these germ cells is they can pass that mutation on to children, which means that you'll see this mutation being passed on from generation to generation all through the family tree. And this is predominantly the type of mutation that causes HLRCC. The H stands for hereditary, meaning we're going to inherit from either one of our parents. In the case of HLRCC, this is going to be a 50-50 probability of inheriting it from a parent. And we'll see in the next lecture what makes it 50-50. The other type of mutation then is going to be what's known as a somatic mutation. And what this means is it's a mutation in any other cell in the body that isn't a sperm and an egg. And what that means is you can't pass somatic mutations on to your offspring, but they can affect your body once they're there. And so then we can acquire somatic mutations anytime after conception all throughout your life. And obviously, then germline mutations are important for HLRCC. But these somatic mutations are also going to be important because they're going to be what eventually can cause tumors, whether they're leiomyomas or renal cell carcinoma, because it's going to be this double hit, is what we call it, when you have your germline mutation or your inherited mutation, and then this secondary somatic mutation occurring in the same cell. And once that happens in one cell, it leads it on a pathway to uh, turn into a cancerous or malignant cell. So then to get a better idea of how these mistakes in the genetic code can cause issues in the resulting protein, here I've made up my own genetic sequence. And when we break this up into the individual codons, we can see which amino acids they code for. So if you remember GAG, GAG is going to code for E or glutamine. Then we'll go down the line in our sequence of amino acids. And to get a better idea of what this job of this made up protein is going to be, this protein's job is going to be to eat the pie, or we'll say the active site on this protein is going to be to eat the pie. So then we can see how different mutations can affect the resulting action of this protein. So one type of mutation then is going to be what's called a point mutation, or when you have a change to just one nucleotide in this genetic sequence. And there's going to be different types of point mutations. The first one we'll look at is going to be a silent mutation. And this is when the change in nucleotides is going to code for the exact same amino acid, meaning there's not going to be any change to the resulting protein or amino acid sequence. So here we can see we've changed ACG to ACA. And when we look at our cipher down here, ACG and ACA, they're going to code for the same exact amino acid threonine. And so when this protein's made, it's still going to say eat the pie. So we can still make sense of what the job of this protein is going to be. And so we're not going to have any dysfunction or pathology associated with these silent mutations. A lot of times you'll also see them called synonymous mutations, meaning they code for the synonymous amino acid. And so if you got a genetic report, the way you would write out this mutation, you'd first specify which exon this is found on. So in this case, we're on exon 10. The C period means that it's on the coding sequence of the DNA, and the coding sequence is going to be the one used to make amino acids. And then this number here is in reference to which number nucleotide it is. So if you remember, the FH gene had 1,530 nucleotides. So this mutation occurred at nucleotide 1,445, 
and we've changed the guanine to an adenine. So this greater sign uh, means to change from guanine to adenine. A second type of point mutation is going to be what's known as a missense mutation. And this is going to be when you have a substitution to a nucleotide that does cause a change in the amino acid that's put in its place. And there's going to be two types of missense mutations. Sometimes it's not going to cause a big issue, and this is what's known as a conservative change. It means you're going to put a very similar type of amino acid in place of the one you've uh, changed. And if you remember that chart of amino acids I showed, some amino acids are very chemically similar to other ones, like they might be both positively charged. And so when you replace one with the other, it's not going to have drastic changes to the resulting protein. So an example of a conservative change would be here if we went from GCA to GAA, we've changed this alanine to another glutamine, but you'll notice we can still make sense of the job of this protein. It still says eat the pie. It's not spelled the correct way. It's not put together the exact way it should be but it hasn't been changed enough for us to not know what it's supposed to do. So this would be an example of a conservative change. The amino acid is close enough to the original one where the entire structure isn't drastically different and it can still do its job. However, sometimes you're going to have significant changes and these are what are known as non-conservative changes where the mutation leads to a very different structure and it's very likely that this is going to result in a pathological uh, situation. So the example here is instead of GAA in this last codon, we change that to AAA. Then instead of saying eat the pie, it's going to say eat the pick. So one, this protein is not going to do what it's designed to do. It's going to not eat the pie like it's designed to. It's going to go around and eat picks. And eating picks is going to be dangerous and it's going to cause all these issues. And this is how you get pathology. So we can see how just this one little change, depending on where it occurs, can either be drastic or not drastic. So in this case, non-conservative missense mutations are going to lead to pathology. The third type of point mutation you can have is what's known as a nonsense mutation. And this is when we put a premature translational stop signal where it doesn't belong. If you remember, at the end of every nucleotide sequence, we're going to have that stop codon that lets the cell know that we finished our amino acid sequence and we can complete our protein. So what happens with these nonsense mutations is we're going to put a premature stop signal where it doesn't belong or before we're finished putting the entire protein together. So here we've went from GAA to UAA. And when we look at UAA, we have our stop signal here. And what's going to happen is we're going to stop making this protein halfway before we've assembled all the amino acids together. The way you're going to see nonsense mutations written on a genetic report, again, you have exon 10 in the coding sequence. Here we're at nucleotide 1,452, and we've changed it from a guanine to a thymine. And if you remember, here's our mRNA. In an mRNA, we use uracil or U, and the reason I have that here is because our cipher has U. But in our coding DNA, this U is actually going to be written as a thymine nucleotide. But functionally the same thing, so don't get caught up in the difference between U and T. You can just uh, replace them one or the other. So along with the nucleotide change, it'll also tell you the protein change. So this P stands for protein, and it means we've changed glutamine to a stop signal. And that's what this uh, asterisk means. The asterisk means we put a stop code on there. So we didn't replace it with another amino acid. We've just stopped all coding after where this glutamine was supposed to be. Another type of mutation is going to be what's known as a deletion. And this is when you get rid of one or more nucleotides in the sequence. So here, if we take a look, if we get rid of this adenine, what happens is it can result in what's known as a frame shift, where the uh, order of codons has been completely shifted over one space. So instead of the codons being uh, arranged the way they're supposed to be, we're going to shift it over one, so then the triplets are going to be completely different. And so if you have a deletion, uh, the way it's going to be written on your genetic report, same as before, it'll specify the nucleotide and the exon it's on, but it's going to have DEL and which nucleotide was deleted. In this case, we deleted adenine at space 1,443. So then we can see what we mean by frame shift is when we look at the new sequence of codons and the amino acids they code for, it completely jumbles the amino acid sequence. So instead of saying eat the pie, it now says ear, hint, lizard. So it makes no sense whatsoever. And this means it's going to almost certainly be pathogenic because it makes absolutely no sense. The structure is going to be completely all over the place. So frame shifts 
are very detrimental to the final protein product. Um, the caveat to this being, if you were to have a deletion uh, in multiples of three, so if you deleted, say, instead of just A, you deleted ACG, the codons would still stay the same. You wouldn't shift them over. You would just lose this amino acid here. So whether or not that would be enough to cause a pathological condition uh, depends on the specific part of the amino acid that's being lost. Along with deletions, then we can also have the opposite where we insert an extra nucleotide, but this is going to cause the same issue because we're still going to cause a shift in the reading frame itself. So here, if we add an adenine here, we're going to cause a shift in all the codons downstream from that adenine. So then the way an insertion is going to be written on your genetic report, it's going to specify which nucleotide was inserted. So INS means insertion. Here, we're putting an adenine between nucleotides 1,455 and 1,456. So right here is where we've inserted our adenine. So then when we look at the resulting codon frame shift, again, you can see everything after it is not going to make sense because it wasn't in a multiple three. So we completely jumbled the code again. And again, this is going to likely be pathogenic. There are instances in which you can completely reverse the certain portion of the genetic code. And this is what's known as an inversion where you reverse the order of nucleotides in a particular sequence of the code. So here we've reversed it, and now you can see the resulting amino acid says ta ta he, the pi. Doesn't make any sense, so likely pathogenic. So inversion on your genetic report, it'll specify again inversion, and it'll say which part of the sequence has been inverted. So all the way from nucleotides 1,437 to 1,048 have been completely reversed. Another type of mutation then is going to be a duplication where one or more nucleotides is going to be copied and repeating next to the original sequence. So in this example, we'll duplicate this GAA. And because it's a multiple of three, it's not going to cause a frame shift or anything, but we are going to add another amino acid glutamate here. So in this case, it might not be pathogenic because we can still make sense of our sequence. But if you were to duplicate um, something that wasn't a multiple of three, you would have a frame shift and it would very likely be pathogenic. So if you were to have a duplication on your genetic report, you'd have DUP for duplication, and then it would specify which part of the nucleotide sequence was uh, duplicated. In this case, nucleotides 1,452 to 1,454. So all the mutations we just looked at were mutations in the exons or that final coding sequence of that messenger RNA. However, if you remember, we had a lot of junk DNA in our immature RNA that we had to cut out to put together those final 10 exons. And what happens is if you have a mutation in certain parts of the introns, the cell's not going to know the correct areas to splice. So a quick review of how we splice correctly is we want the correct splicing zones in this area here. And the way the cell knows where to splice is what's known as the GUAG rule where wherever the cell sees a GU and an AG and some upstream nucleotides to kind of signal exactly where they are, um, this is going to tell certain proteins called spliceosomes where to cut precisely to get the correct exons in that final coding sequence. And so then what that looks like is when we make our correct splices, the spliceosome comes over, it's going to cut out the intron we don't need, and then it's going to add those exons together to form that final mRNA. And this is the way it's supposed to work. However, if you have a mutation in some of these critical introns, it's going to result in incorrect splicing. And what happens then is it can either lead to a loss of an exon or it can lead to the inclusion of introns. And when you add more code than necessary, that's obviously going to mess up the final protein product as well. So for instance, if we change this guanine to an adenine, um, we're not going to know where to splice possibly. So if you would have an intron mutation on your genetic report, um, it's a little bit more complicated to read. So in this case, because we're closer to exon 2, we're going to use this as if this is nucleotide 166, this is nucleotide 165. We're going to say the intron mutation occurred 13 nucleotides prior to the 166. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, all the way to 13. So negative 13, we're specifying this part of the intron. So if you had an intron mutation that said positive, for instance, say this as positive 6, it's going to be in reference to the exon in front of it. So instead of 166, this would say 165. And plus 6 would be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. It would be referencing this nucleotide if you had a mutation with a positive number.
So then we can look at a more generalized example of how all of this comes together. So here we have a zoomed out look of our immature RNA. We have those GUAG sequences. And so the way this is going to work is we're going to splice precisely at the right locations of those GUAG sites. We're going to cut out those introns and splice together our exons. And this is the correct way of making our final coding sequence. So this is how it should work. However, you can see if we had a mutation in this one AG acceptor site, the spliceosome is going to skip over this and look for the next AG splicing site. And so what that's going to mean, we're going to cut out this entire area. And along with cutting out our introns, we're also going to mistakenly cut out exon 2 and then splice exon 1 and exon 3 together. And so this means we've mistakenly taken out an entire exon and now our protein isn't going to be put together correctly because we're going to be missing a whole part of our coding sequence because of that one mutation in the intron. Another thing that can happen with introns is if we accidentally put an acceptor site too early or too upstream in our intron, and it's going to cause a splice too early on. And when we splice out that um, intron, we're still going to leave half of intron one in there. And so we've mistakenly included half of intron one in our final coding sequence, and that's going to add amino acids that are unnecessary and cause dysfunction. If we were having mutation in, say, our second donor site, so instead of GU, we have GC here, we're going to skip over this splice site, and we're going to look for the next GU site, which would be down here. And so we're not going to cut any of this out, which means we're going to leave intron 2 in our final product. So here we've successfully cut out intron 1, but we didn't know to cut out intron 2, and that's being left in our final coding sequence, which is obviously not good. Lastly, you can have mutations at the very ends of your RNA. These are what are known as the UTR sections. UTR just stands for untranslated region, which means that you're going to have some nucleotides here, but they don't code for any amino acids. But these UTR sections are going to be necessary to stabilize the RNA. They're going to make sure the cell doesn't break down the RNA prematurely. They're also going to be kind of binding sites for ribosomes, so the ribosome knows where to start um, in its process of translating. And so if you would have mutations in these UTRs, it could possibly cause loss of function in the protein, meaning if the ribosome doesn't know where to bind, it can't make the protein at all, or it can decrease the rate of translation. So instead of you know, making 100 proteins per second, you're only making 10 proteins per second. You're going to have a deficient amount of proteins in the cell. And lastly, then, you can have what's known as a total gene deletion, where you are missing a complete section of the chromosome. And this is what's known as a micro deletion or a small section of the chromosome just gets completely removed. So here, if you remember, FH gene is on chromosome 1 at band 43 on the Q arm. And so with microdeletion, we'll just completely get rid of that section of the chromosome. And so what classifies something as a microdeletion is if you're missing less than 5 million nucleotides in that region. Now, that might seem like a lot of nucleotides, and it is, but all told, chromosome 1 has about 240 million nucleotides. So 5 million is why they call it a microdeletion, even though it has significant repercussions. And what this also means then is that multiple genes are going to be lost. It's not just the FH gene that's disappearing. You're going to have genes above and below it also um, that are going to be missing as well. So there'll be other issues possibly associated with these total gene deletions. And the issue with total gene deletions is the normal way genetic tests look for mutations it's going to miss a total gene mutation because if you're completely missing that gene, nothing's going to show up on the genetic report because there was nothing to, for that uh, test to look at. So there's going to be other ways to test if you have a deletion or not. So the key question is then whether or not your mutation is going to cause pathology or not. And a lot of times because HLRCC is so rare, we don't have a lot of experience knowing which mutations are bad and which ones are benign. And so a lot of times your mutation will be called what's known as a variant of unknown significance or VUS. And this just means that we don't know precisely how your mutation is going to create a protein and whether it's going to be dysfunctional or not. And the reason this is, is because it's very hard to predict what changes in amino acids will cause significant changes to the final protein. And this is what we call the protein folding problem. It's just so complicated trying to figure out how one amino acid can change the entire uh, structure of a protein. We just haven't figured out a good way of figuring out which amino acids are vital and which ones aren't. 
Um, there are artificial intelligence programs that are getting better at trying to figure this out, but we're still a long way of knowing precisely which ones are um, vital and which ones aren't. And so what you need to do then is you need to look at all the databases of known cases of HLRCC and seeing how those patients have fared. And so when you have a VUS, it means there's no uh, previous patients in the databases that share your exact mutation. So that means that we're unable to say with certainty whether or not your mutation is going to be pathogenic or benign, but you can compare it to other closely related mutations, maybe like the mutation on the amino acid right before it or right behind it, and we'll, get a, we'll be able to take a better guess then on how your mutation will compare to them. And so if you're curious about what all these databases look like and all the known HLRCC cases and resulting variants in their genetic code, you can take a look at these different links I've posted underneath the video. So here, if we look at this assemble one, you can see all these highlighted regions and all the exons show all the different types of mutations. Another one is going to be this GNOME AD one. And what's nice about this one is it has all the different variants and you can see the different types. So lots of synonymous ones, which obviously aren't going to be pathogenic. So it always says likely benign. Uh, you can see all the different missense ones with uncertain significance or VUS just means they're not sure. Uh, lots of intron ones. So again, you can see, you know, the negative 42. You see intron. Uh, a couple of frame shift ones. You can see all pathogenic because we saw how it just jumbles the code. And a couple of those UTR ones, which likely benign or unknown. Uh, Varsum also has a very nice uh, database. And what I like about this one is when you scroll down, it'll say whether or not they know it's pathogenic or likely pathogenic. So all the silent ones, all likely benign. However, the nonsense or frame shift, all of them are going to be pathogenic. And that doesn't mean you're going to get cancer. It just means that you'll have some issues like maybe like the uterine lyomyomas or the skin lyomyomas. And so before we wrap it up, I'll show you through an example of my genetic report, how you can look at the information on it and kind of get a better idea using the resources we just went over. So here we can see my variant details, uh, my mutations on exon 10, coding region, uh, nucleotide 1445. We changed the T to a G. And so this means that the amino acid leucine at spot 42 has been changed to a premature translational stop signal, because that's what that star means, premature stop signal. So now what we can do is we can look at the entire exome or all 10 exons and the nucleotides that code for those amino acids, and we can find my mutation by going to exon 10. So here we start at exon 1, go all the way down to the very end. This is exon 10 right here. And we're looking for nucleotide 1445. So at the end of this line, this is nucleotide 1440. So I'll go here to five more. So one, two, three, four, five. So this here is, should be a T, and that's what it says on my report. It went from a T to a G. So I changed it to, instead of um, TTA, it's going to be TGA. And then, so if we look at what TGA codes for, again, you're changing the T to a U for the uracil and the MRI. We have U, G, A, and we have our stop signal. So this is my premature stop signal, all changed because of that one point mutation at nucleotide 1445. And so what that means then is when we look at all these remaining nucleotides, these are going to be left out of the final protein product which means that we've left 29 amino acids off of our final protein. And as we saw on that previous website, whenever you have these premature stop signals, it's going to be most likely pathogenic. Now, um, we won't know that for sure, and we see that here is that this says the variant is not present in the population databases, so they can't say exactly for certain what um, is going to happen, but they can compare it to other individuals with uh, very similar uh, stop codons. So here it'll say the variant disrupts the C-terminus or the bottom end or the end of the protein. And other variants that disrupt that area um, were determined to be pathogenic. So I can be fairly certain that this is going to lead to issues. And that's why I have leomyomas and um, uh, kidney cysts. And so some of you might also see in your report this phrase that says it's not anticipated to result in nonsense mediated decay. Um, so what that means when they put that in there is sometimes when you have a mutation and the mRNA isn't what it's supposed to be, there's different machinery in the cell that recognizes that this mRNA is junk 
and it shouldn't be copied, and it just destroys it. And so it's just going to cause it to decay. And so then you won't copy it and you won't make a dysfunctional protein. In this case, my mutation doesn't raise those red flags. And so it sneaks past that uh, nonsense media decay and it's going to end up coding for a dysfunctional protein. And so it kind of evades my cell's surveillance system. And now that we know where in the sequence my mutation occurs at leucine 482, we can look then at this three dimensional model and we can see precisely where leucine 482 is. So here we have leucine 482 and everything beyond it. So this entire tail end is going to be missing from my final protein. And this is what causes it to not work or do its job the normal way. So thanks again for watching. Hopefully you learned a little bit more about mutation. If you have any questions specifically directed at your own personal mutation, feel free to message me on Facebook or leave a comment on YouTube and I'll reach out to you. And we can try to figure out the specifics of your own personal case um, if that's what you're interested in. Uh, thanks again, and I'll see you next video.